My name is Josh Smith. Uh, I have the honor to serve on the board of uh, 2020 Mom. I'm currently the vice chair uh, for the board of directors, and it's my honor also to be able to present uh, the next person to uh, share their insight uh, into this space. Uh, the person that we have today is Enkim Ndifu. She's a MSN, CNM, uh, RN, uh, is the founder and president of Loomis Transforms and creator of the Resilience Toolkit, a model that promotes embodied self-awareness and self-regulation in an ecologically sensitive framework and social justice context. Uh, licensed as a registered nurse and nurse midwife, Enkim also has extensive postgraduate training in complementary health modalities and emotional therapies. She served on the Los Angeles County Trauma and Resilience Informed Systems Change Initiative Workgroup and developed a pilot trauma-informed learning academy for peer support workers as part of Los Angeles County Department of Public Health Trauma Prevention Initiative. Welcome. So, let me see here. Even before, um, we do anything. People are eating, maybe you wolfed it down, maybe you're slowly eating. But just to take a moment and, I mean, so much information has come at us, at our heads, at our hearts, at our bodies, to just stop and to see how, how we're doing with that. Right? Let's just stop for a moment. And so just turning inwards, and you could keep eating, don't have to stop any of your, what you're doing, but turning and observing inwards, just what's going on for you mentally, what's sort of the temperature emotionally, and how you're feeling physically. Just how much stress are you carrying? How relaxed do you feel? Just taking a mental note of that. And I'd actually invite you, if you have a neighbor, find your nearest neighbor and turn to them and introduce yourself, your name, if you haven't already, and one thing that you noticed when you did that quick little scan. A little. Okay, and gently wrapping up those quick little shares. Again, this is just helps us bring our whole beings into the space, right? Helps us connect. So I just wanna review some objectives um, so we know, I just think it's really important to be transparent about what we're doing. I know everyone blows through objectives, but I actually think it's very helpful so we're all on the same page um, about what is, we're going to start with self-care. Really, what is effective self-care? It's a question that's not asked very much. Um, and talking about the relationship of our individual resilience to systems of adversity, right? Where do we sit? individually in the ecology. And to just begin to start nudging forward your skill for self-awareness and embodied awareness of your own stress, maybe even trauma, and definitely relaxation responses. And how appropriate are your responses to any given situation that you find yourself in? And we're going to practice with a few little tools to help settle stress activation that's not adaptive and not serving you in the moment. Okay? So we can't do too much in an hour, but we'll try. All right? So I'd like to start with self-care. And if you could for a moment, and you can write this if you like, or just think about it, okay, is two activities. Think of two activities that you're currently doing for self-care. Two activities, again, mentally or just take a note. And how often are you actually doing them? Like truthfully, in the last three months, how are you doing those daily or they're kind of your self-care things but you haven't done them in three months, right? So just this is just, you know, being honest with yourself. And then probably the most important questions is how well does the activity work for you and how do you know that the activity is working for you as a self-care activity how do you know 
It's a question I often ask and people look at me and say, that's not something I've really been asked before. Okay. So let's just spend a few moments in, in quiet reflection. What two things are you doing? How often do you use them? How well do they work? And how do you know they work? Okay. So I'm curious if a few folks would be interested in sharing out into the group what came up for them when they did this. I see one hand here and one hand here. If we could get microphones here and here. On, hello. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Hi, how are you? Um, Okay, so self-care. My two that I thought about first, I went from two to four, but my two that I thought about first was exercising um, and watching some shows after I put the kids to bed to unwind. Like, nobody bother me, I'm gonna watch some, you know, some shows on TV. Um, so exercising works very well. It makes me feel better about myself mentally, gives me more energy, um, but how often do I do it? Not as often as I would like to. So this week I set a goal for myself to exercise four times. I've done it once, but I plan to do it again today and then I have you know a few more days left in the week. Um, as much as I love my shows, they do keep me up later than I um. wish to because you start and you're like, I'm just gonna watch one Mm -hmm. But then there's another episode that I didn't watch yet, and I need to catch up. And then it's like it's starting in 10, 9. I'm like, I'm just going to watch the first five minutes. And the next thing you know, it's like midnight. And I'm up all throughout the night with my adventurous night owl children. Um, so it sounds like you've got two things, one that helps you feel better about yourself, and one that sounds like it gives you some quiet down you time, but at the same time it robs sleep. Yes. Okay, so there's a trade-off there. Mm -hmm. Great. Can we hear from, we have Lasana. Okay, um, self-care for me is nutrition. Nutrition, and uh, I prefer to eat holistic, you know, like holistically, you know, a lot of vegetables, salads, and things like that. And another thing is um, getting proper sleep then I feel like I can, you know, like I am, I got everything, the base is good, you know, with the nutrition and the rest, the base is good. And then other things I like to do is uh, window shop, especially if I don't have the money. I like the window shop and that motivates me so when I, to work. And then once I do get the money, then I can go get what I like. All and right. then I can keep my environment nice and that just makes me feel good about myself. All right, so what I'm hearing here is feeling like my bases are covered, my foundation is covered, and I'm getting motivation yeah. and inspiration from my self-care, right? Yes. All right, let's do one more. Hi, my name is Betsy Chavez. I work for Hannah Institute, and something that um, we've been able to, well, that I've learned recently, actually in the last three months, because I just started three months ago, um, is that we do pies, and that's um, it's a way of checking in and being in tune in, to what you're feeling intellectually, emotionally, and all that, as well as um, meditation. So some meditation, something I've just, I've never done neither one of those and I've felt the benefits. Um, personally, I, I have four daughters and one of is five months. And so a nice warm shower is something that I can look forward to as part of my self-care plan. Mm -hmm. And so I try to do that as often as I can. I can't always necessarily do that, but um, as well as fit in 10 minutes of a workout. Okay, so nice varied, and some in the workplace setting, some are at home, carving out some time and space for yourself. And so people are using all different kinds of things as self-care, and I want to get in, dig in a little bit more about what is effective self-care. Maybe, oops, no, that will not do it. The qualities of effective self-care. 
many times um, self-care that works it's more I think many of us here are parents and you know how your kids ask for sugar they just want sugar 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 and they want it they just want it but we would be negligent parents if we just gave them sugar, 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 everything they wanted. They want to stay up all late, late, late. We want to let them stay, right? If you give someone everything they want that feels good, it's not necessarily the care that they need, right? So effective self-care deeply feeds us, right? So those words like, I feel better about myself, I feel motivated, I feel energized, I feel connected, I feel more whole, I feel re-inspired, I feel rested and rejuvenated. These are the types of words that are associated with effective self-care, right? It's after you do it, you feel better for it. Okay. And so there's this big confusion between self-care and self-indulgence. I'm known for like being kind of a truth teller and asking really hard questions even if we don't know answers. Those are exactly the questions we need to be asking. So I may say things and be like, ooh, that's a little harsh. But if we don't call things by their right name, we can't do the right things, okay? There is nothing wrong with self-indulgence, but it is not self-care. If you come home after a hard day and you just eat the whole thing of ice cream, because you like, I deserve it. <laughs> and you do deserve it, right? You worked hard and you eat that whole thing of ice cream, that's self-indulgence. But how do you feel afterwards? Did that move you forward in care? No, it didn't. So don't call it self-care. It's self-indulgence and that's okay. But be aware if this goes on. I mean, the same person can say, I had a hard day, I I'm gonna sh shoot heroin. Like some things are okay and some things aren't. I had a hard day, I'm gonna Netflix binge. So what you do is either socially acceptable or not, but the impulse behind it is the same, to distract yourself, to get away, to numb out, okay? And again, I have no judgment, just call it what it is. And if that's your only thing you're doing and you wonder why it's not working, it's because it's like this. Maybe, I don't know if they have it here, maybe. No. If I'm watching a movie and it's really like scary and creepy and I'm like, ooh, and I just say, I can't take this, and I just press the pause button, I get a break. But when I press start, it's exactly where I left off. And that's what often self-indulgence does, is it gives us a break. And sometimes that's all you can get, and that's okay. But don't be surprised, it's not moving you forward. It's not effective in the sense it's moving you forward. And so, and truthfully, if we look at the kind of hard work that many of us do, the, I, I love chocolate, there is not enough chocolate in the world to heal trauma. <laughs> okay, just, there isn't. I, you can only get so many pedicures. You can take so many baths. All right, <laughs> I'm gonna try. Okay, so these are some things to, to think about. And now I'm gonna say some things that might be really hard to hear, but I'm gonna say them. We often hear in workplace settings that people should be using self-care to treat burnout. And I'm gonna say really clearly that burnout is a result of systems problems. It's not having autonomy in your work. It is having unreasonable work demands and not being respected in your work. There is no self-care that is going to lower the paperwork that you have to fill out. There is no self-care that's going to house your clients or magically create affordable, accessible mental health services <laughs> on every corner. Right? So when we use self-care to, as a, you know, and we see this a lot in organizations around burnout, that's a way to individualize a system's problem and for the system to not take responsibility for the creation of burnout. So I'm pushing back. Is, is self-care a good thing? Absolutely. It just is not a cure for burnout. 
Okay, now I'm going to take on vicarious trauma. Okay, first off, if somebody was assaulted and went for help, uh, went for um, counseling services, would you say self-care? That's a good, good cure for your trauma. Would you, would anybody say that? No. Why on earth would we ever think that self-care would be a cure for vicarious, professional vicarious trauma? Self-care is not a cure for trauma. It is not a treatment for trauma. Is it an adjunct? Absolutely. But it is not a substitute for treatment. Are we saying that vicarious trauma is less serious than primary trauma? Is that what we're saying? So then if you're in your workplace and you're vicariously traumatized, self-care is enough because it's not as serious as primary trauma. And I'm going to push back on that. In some ways, I think vicarious trauma is worse because a big feature of trauma is feeling helpless. I can't do anything. Talk about being the provider of services and witnessing somebody having trauma or hearing a trauma story. There is a zero you can do about. They are the ones of agency in the situation. So you are actually more helpless listening to someone's story. And in some ways, that trauma is worse. And I think it needs to be called out as such. And again, Self-care is not trauma treatment. It's an adjunct. And so when we see workplaces, and I'm going to say it, say self-care for their staff around vicarious trauma, they are abdicating their responsibility for providing their employees and volunteers with real substantive mental health care and pushing it onto the employee. So. For folks who are working in management, this is hard to hear. <laughs> For folks who are working at line staff, I think we know this is true and it's hard to push back and say, you know, we need, we need reasonable work um, conditions and we need access to uh, mental health care for us for the, how hard this work is. And we're happy to do self-care, but it is not a substitute. Thanks for the pizza party. Okay. So I know this is supposed to be about caring for the caregiver and everyone thought, okay, we're all going to be doing like some breathing and we're all going to do self-care and we are going to do that. But I wanted to set the context that that is not enough, that it is not just the responsibility of the individual. It is the responsibility of the groups of um, people and organizations and communities that we work to take care of each other and create systems of care not just for the people we're entrusted to serve, but also for those of us that are providing services. So caring for the caregiver is a group affair. Y'all with me? All right, just checking. Or you're just zoning out on that chicken. <laughs> zoning out on that chicken. OK, so no big surprise, self-care alone will not address burnout or vicarious trauma. So if you walk away from nothing else from this, please walk away with that. Right? And how do we create systems of care and uh, for, for not, because we all know you can't give from an empty cup, right? And so when we really want to provide those services to the folks entrusted to our care, this is not just our responsibility to take care of ourselves, it's the systems that we work in to help take care of us too. Okay. That said, I'm not a fan of individualizing systems problems, but I also realize systems won't change themselves. Right? They just don't jump up and change themselves. Who's going to change them? You're looking at this is these we. We are the ones who are going to change systems. So how are we resourced in order to make those changes to the system that will better support us? How does that happen? Right? And here's where self-care is super important. That's where that self-resourcing allows us to have the bandwidth to make those changes. And so what I want to spend the rest of the time here um, talking about most of the time is about a system that I developed, a modality. It's a way of thinking about um, self-awareness and thinking about regulating our stress responses called the Resilience Toolkit. And I'm going to run you all through a mini toolkit. Um, and 
it's really some of the, even that guiding question, that question that I asked at the beginning, how did you know your self-care works? That's one of our guiding questions is like, how do things work? It's not just enough to say, here's a bunch of practices and use them. It's how to think about when would I use the one? How do I know it works for me? When do I stop using it? So it's a lot about thinking, not just the tools, it's the kit and how we think about it, okay? And so the Resilience Toolkit has some core components, four core components actually, about developing an embodied awareness of our own stress and relaxation. Because if you don't know where you are, you don't know if you need anything, right? Like if you didn't have a gauge on your car of how much gas was in the tank, how would you know you needed to refill it? You wouldn't know until you ran out. So it's really important for us to also have this gauge and understand where we are at any given moment, okay? And it's not enough just us, we don't, we're not islands. How do we exist in our environments? How do we appraise, is our stress helping us or hurting us, okay? Stress is there to help us perform, to help us defend and keep ourselves safe and those that we love safe. There's nothing wrong with it, right? It's just, is it matching? Is it helping me in this situation? I did a workshop yesterday for a homeless service agency and one, um, and many of the people in the organization have lived experience. Um, and so it's extra hard work, I think. And one woman, and so they really feel the urgency to, to do the work. And one woman was just like, stress is always bad. She could not imagine stress being good. And she had no, like really as we got into it, this idea that, oh, I could turn it off. Like there are times when it's helping me and there's times when it's hurting me. It was like just a novel way to think about it. So I just wanna introduce that. Um, and it brings in the importance of the social ecology around you. The third component of the toolkit is that we use brief mindfulness and movement tools that can be practiced in real time. This is not about going on a retreat. Retreats are lovely. Most of us don't have the time, you know, time budget or financial budget to do so. And we often need relief in the moment. So what can be used in 15 seconds, 30 seconds? one minute without anyone knowing that you're doing it in the moment when you need it, okay? But we provide guidance because different types of interventions work better or worse depending on your level of stress. Sometimes very high level, high stress load or a high trauma load turning inwards actually makes you worse. You may need rhythmic movement. So being able to have some guidance about where to start, where to, what, what, um, what tools might be good starting points. But we use a very, it's a very trauma-informed way of working in the sense of we're gonna co-collaborate together to figure out what works for you and what doesn't. And in the process of figuring out what makes me more stressed, when I do that breathing, I feel more stressed. Or when I do that, I feel more, how do you know? Right? So it develops your self-awareness and also a greater sense of self-agency of control over what you want to do given any response that you're having, which way you want to go. And we lastly use behavior change theory to support people of developing robust habits, to implement those changes into their lives, to work with ambivalence around how do, I, how do I make these plans? How do I um, integrate these practices and perspectives to build? Because it's not like you can sprinkle fairy dust and you're resilient now. <laughs> we know that that's a practice, okay? So generally we, work, we like to work with people over multiple sessions, but we're doing a little mini toolkit today here. You interested a little bit? Okay, we'll do a little one. Okay. so. For this one, I'm going to use this very common model that many of you, I'm sure, have seen and worked with, where social nervous system is sort of a relaxed state, a fight flight is a moderate stress, and a freeze would be a strong, strong stressor or trauma. This is one of many models that we use. Understanding that a model is not the thing. 
the Google map on your phone is not actually the roads in front of you. It's a map, it's a representation, and it distorts the road. This distorts, this misses things about chronicity. This misses things about gender. This misses things about social hierarchy. It's a very simplified model, but it's a useful model, and we're gonna use it today, but recognizing that it doesn't encompass everybody's stress or trauma responses. Some people are like, that just doesn't fit me, because the model is not complete. Okay, but for this one, I usually like to start with the social nervous system, which is a relaxed state, and ask people to think about for yourself how do you know when you're actually relaxed? When there's no threat and no demand, how do you know? Here, I was like, ooh. I heard some ooh in the room, right? Because if you can't answer that question, you can't evaluate are any of your self-care methods working, right? So thinking back for yourself, does anybody want to yell out how do they know? We can take a few. Yeah, just. Okay. So when she feels her thoughts slowing down, thoughts slowing down. Mm -hmm. So breathing is just happening naturally. So what are they? Thoughts are calm. And so you're going to notice when folks say, I'm not this, I'm ignoring the not and I'm asking for the other side, right? Not, I heard you perfectly, I'm doing it intentionally. There was another hand. When my self-care routine in the morning works, mm -hmm. I experience more calm when I'm driving to work. More calm when I'm driving. So what, here's another one. When I fall asleep. When you fall asleep, okay. Mm -hmm. And some people can fall asleep, if anyone has ever had a fall asleep and then jerked, right? So an activity, by and large, doesn't necessarily mean that you feel any one way. You might feel a sense of settling, a sense of relaxation and letting go, while another person might feel terror in falling asleep. Okay? So in general, when we're in this state, we feel connected, we feel vibrant, right? We're curious interested in new things, patient. We can access joy and love. Our bodies are relaxed, the, all systems working well. Our immune system, our hormone system, it's a symphony around that childbearing year, those hormones, but that symphony is in tune. And it's not just an emotional state, it's not just a mental state where we can focus and this type of thing. It's a physical, a biological state. It's all of those things. And so just to point out, there's like one thing I really like to drive home here is that when we're in that state, our nerves to our ears literally retune our hearings to the range of the human voice. We hear each other better here, biologically. The nerves to my vocal cords, you're going to hear a nice rhythm and tone shifts in my voice. And you, you don't really notice it except when it's absent. When somebody talks in a monotone, you know something's wrong. But that's literally the biology of the facial expressions. And this should be our baseline. Our culture doesn't support it so much. Our workplaces don't support it so much, right? Our, right? Um, this is a place where we heal and we rejuvenate, where we connect, where we dream, right? where we grow. And so being able to know this place and return to this place is really, really important. Really, really important. And I like to center that when I start talking about stress rather than the, the high part. Like, let's talk about what this is.
But we're also not supposed to be there all the time. That's also not practical and it's not realistic or even healthy. You need a stress response, again, to perform or to defend. And so when we, our stress starts to rise and we go into maybe a low grade fight flight, how do you know? And I heard some of those, right? My brain is faster, right? I'm thinking about my breathing. What else happens? Tension. Who's the jaw clenchers? Who's the shoulders? Who's the stomach? Right? Even when you see, um, you know, you wake up and you're kind of like constricted, right? What else? What else happens? Quick thoughts, rigid. I get very bossy. That's me. Irritated. Irritated, short fuse. Work dreams, pressure dreams, chase dreams, fall hard to fall asleep, wake up during the night, wake up early, feel like you didn't even sleep. I get too lenient, then I regret it after, so it's more of a flight. Flight, right? Like, whatever. I can't deal with that. Procrastination. There's a lot, you know, we breathe faster, our temperature changes. In general, there's a sense of pressure, constriction, hurry. There's not enough time. Come on. Rigidity, focus, which is needed. Like when I worked as a doing deliveries as a midwife, somebody's bleeding. I need to be bossy and I need to be focused to make sure someone stops bleeding. That's appropriate, right? That's an appropriate response. So my vision just goes whoo, right? Literally, right, to this. I need this, I need this, I need this, whatever we're doing, okay? So nothing wrong with this response. It's adaptive and life-giving when appropriately scaled to the situation. And I think we all know this very well. And even, Mary, I talked about the changes in the hearing. As danger starts to rise, our ears retune to away from the range of the human voice to danger sounds in the environment, low sounds. And the best way to, to really you know, get this is imagine you were sitting around a campfire at night out in the wilderness, and suddenly you heard some rustling in the bushes. And you would tighten, kind of hold your breath a little bit like to see what it is, but your heart's beating and you're trying to listen for what that is. So recognize that as stress rises, this is what happens to us as humans. We become impatient and short-fused and we literally can't hear each other. Literally, and you know that if you've been in an argument with somebody, you're like, are you listening? Are you listening? <laughs> Ain't nobody listening. <laughs> and it's biological. So it's our responsibility in interactions, how do we get down into our social nervous system so we can hear one another. And so when you're working with clients and they're anxious and you feel like you're repeating yourself and so you write it, they can't hear you. Doesn't matter how slow you talk, <laughs> right? How do you help them settle? If you can't, if you join them up there and talk faster and you know, then the two of you are there. How do you downregulate your stress response so they can join you? There's a sense of movement. I'm either moving towards in confrontation or to tackle a problem. It's not even a person. All right, to perform. There's a sense of movement or away. Hit the deck. Hit the deck. Okay, so this is our adrenaline, our sympathetic nervous system. Um, so I'm gonna, just right now, like notice, how's your stress level feeling at this moment, talking about all this stress? Do you notice there's been a shift in your body, right? In your mind, in your thinking, from where I asked at the beginning. Maybe it's climbed up a little bit, okay? So I'm going to facilitate a couple of practices, and let's see if we can click it down a notch. In the toolkit, we ask, we're really doing these for stress reduction. So if they don't work for you, next, just 
skip, they're short. I'm gonna facilitate, they're very short, 30 seconds, maybe a minute, and then the next one's coming. So if it doesn't work, just next. Um, the, we do use some mindfulness tools, and I wanna be very explicit that mindfulness in the United States, particularly, has been co-opted from Buddhism. Buddhism is a religion. And then maybe you've heard me, if you've heard me speak, I've said this before and I'll, I say it often, is there is no religion whose goal is stress reduction. That is not the goal of religion, okay? So the goal of Buddhism is not stress reduction. We have co-opted it for stress reduction. Buddhists recognize that when you do mindfulness, you turn inwards and you meet yourself. And that often is not a stress-free path. In fact, it's often a stress-inducing path, especially if you're carrying a lot of stress and trauma when you go in and meet yourself. It actually typically makes things worse. And that is why it is an entire system where you have teachers, where you have um, sacred texts, where you have community that holds you through the path of self-discovery and self-liberation, spiritual liberation, right? So when we co-op mindfulness and we put it in an app and you meet yourself, what happens then? Oops. And I can think, um, my organization was asked to um, provide services for a school-based program for pregnant and parenting teens that said, oh, we're gonna be very trauma-informed and we're gonna start yoga and mindfulness. And they did, and the girls stopped coming to school. Because you're asking them to meet themselves without providing any of that other stuff, okay? So we are very intentionally, when we are providing these tools, that we are providing you with a framework, a framework to start understanding what does it feel like when my stress rises? What does it feel like when my stress settles? Providing um, support and guidance to choose which ones might support me, which might not. Providing ample um, encouragement to move away from discomfort and to orient yourself towards safety and comfort in this process, right? So it's not just Here's some mindfulness, which is often thrown around very cavalierly. It needs to be in a system of support. So as I invite you into the next practices, this is my way of saying, if it's not settling for you, next. That's not how we're using it, okay? And it's something to think about if somebody's saying, here, choose comfort, choose safety, choose ease, and you're like, no, no, I'm gonna take the hard road. There are so many places in life where we're pushed beyond our limits over and over and over again, so much so that it actually erodes our resilience. The ability to rest, to know when it's safe to rest and rest effectively is actually super important for building resilience. So that's part of what we're doing here. No one, there's no gun to anybody's head here. If it's uncomfortable, move away from it and see if you can practice that, okay? So, oh, there's social nervous system, a little fight flight. I was into what I was saying. We're gonna do some grounding and settling breath. So grounding is used in a lot of different ways and defined different, different ways. For here, I'm just gonna invite you, again, eyes open or closed. This is totally optional. If you wanna do it, is turning inwards to your mind. And just noticing, not so much the content of the thoughts, but is it cloudy? Is it clear? Dormy or still? Turning your attention to your emotional landscape. Is it loud or quiet? Not trying to make anything right or wrong, just noticing. Remember, if anything's making you more uncomfortable or more stressed, distract yourself. But if you're doing okay, drop a little further in noticing your body, feeling into the landscape of your body. What's comfortable, what's uncomfortable?
And as you're observing yourself, as you're grounding, notice if your system is settling, your stress is settling, how do you know it's settling? What's telling you? What's shifting? What's changing? And now I'm going to invite you into a second practice. So if you took a break from the first one, welcome back. We're going to do a little breath. Just noticing how you're breathing through your mouth, through your nose. Human body is very interesting. When we breathe out, our heartbeat slows. When we breathe in, our heartbeat quickens. So we're going to take advantage. The next time you exhale, just lengthen the exhale a little bit. Still an easy and relaxed breath, just a little longer than the inhale. Some people like to count, maybe two on the inhale and four on the exhale. Some people hate counting. Do what works for you. And if it doesn't work and you feel more stressed, return to a regular breath. it is working for you, how do you know it's working? What's shifting? What's changing in your system? Is your mind slowing, clearing? Are muscles relaxing? What's changing? And now I'm going to invite you back into the space. If your eyes were closed, to open them. And if they are open, to focus them. So that was two practices, a grounding and a settling breath. You may have loved both. You may have hated both. You may have liked one better than the other. There is nothing wrong with the practices, and there's nothing wrong with you. Different strokes, different folks, different time. Bless you. I'd like to move us into talking a little bit about freeze. Freeze is, you know, it's an overwhelm. It's when mobilization isn't adaptive, when shutting down going numb, um, closing up works. There are multiple kinds of freeze. They tend to get lumped together. And obviously, in this short time we have, we're, we are going to do a lot of lumping. Um, there's the shock of something happening suddenly, and you can't speak, you can't move. Right? actually called tonic immobility, and, and it's actually not compatible with life for very long. You can go into shock. Right? It was first recognized in humans in sexual assault, but it occurs in many other places. Right? We see, I think, often the slow grind of burnout where you don't care anymore, you're overwhelmed, you feel helpless and numb. That's a kind of freeze. You feel very stuck. The thing I want to emphasize here is that no one goes into freeze like, oh, I think I want to go and freeze today. That'll be fun, right? It's not like it's a choice. And we freeze for a reason, historical or current, meaning there was something where freeze was a better alternative. Freeze is a very metabolically costly survival mechanism. It is not chosen lightly by your organism. And so when it is chosen, know that the alternative is often harder, right? And so there's a great degree of numbness. Actually, you're producing your own opioids in this state. And so when you ask someone who has a lot of freeze on board to suddenly turn inwards, that's where things get really hairy and rough. So if any of you are using mindfulness and you're not really well trained, or your program wants to use mindfulness and some self-care, and the people who are doing it have had very little training, this is super important. Point to drive home, who are you working with, and how are you holding this, this process? So the practices we use with mindfulness tend to, if we're going to turn inwards, we're turning positively, or positive orientation. Typically, we're looking at movement, rhythmic movement, or orienting outside of the body. Okay? And we kind of, I kind of think of like a bubble of freeze, if we can pop it and settle. A bubble of freeze, can we pop it and settle? So I'm going to invite you into a couple of practices here. 
The first is resourcing. And so this, again, is turning inwards. I'm inviting you to scan your physical body, eyes open or closed, whatever feels safer and more comfortable to you. And you're scanning your physical body for what feels the best at this moment. What sensation feels the best? It might feel warm and lovely and yummy. It might just be neutral. And if you're carrying a lot of pain, it might just be less pain. But something is better than everything else. And see if you can locate that. What is the actual sensation? Again, if you're feeling more stressed, time to stop. But if you're doing OK, really noticing the location, the depth. How wide does it spread? And as you're observing this resource, this sensation in your body, is your stress level shifting or changing? If it's getting worse, you stop. And if it's feeling better, notice what's telling you it's feeling better. Again, muscle tension, breathing, what's shifting? And then I'm going to invite you into a fourth practice, and this is a movement practice that comes from EMDR, for those familiar with that. It was actually developed in Mexico after a hurricane for use with children in a low resource, mental health resource setting. And this, I'm going to demonstrate it first, and I ask you just to watch before trying it, because um, that's about choice. Like, you need to see what you're going to do to see if you even want to do it, <laughs> let's say. So, and I want to show a few things, too. So I've crossed my arms, and I will guide you through this if you do want to do it. And I'm setting my fingertips below my collarbone. And I'm tapping alternately. That's my butterfly, and I'm tapping alternately. And this is, if it's immediately uncomfortable, to please stop. If it's just meh, it's not really doing anything, you can vary the pressure or speed with which you're tapping, right? So I want to explain that to you because some people put their hands on and then I'm still demonstrating it and they're trying to hold on, but it's really uncomfortable. I want to really open that up for choice before you even decide if you want to do it. So if you'd like to do it, you look at your hands, thumbs out, and you cross them. The thumbs can link or just rest together, whatever feels comfortable. And you're going to set that on your chest with the fingertips under the collarbone. And the hands are not sideways, but not constricted up, but orienting more towards your head, the fingertips orienting more towards your head. And from there, there's tapping. You can do it alternately light, heavy, quickly, or slowly. It doesn't feel good, stop. You're enjoying it, enjoy. Again, you can experiment with pace, with depth. You like how it's feeling, what's changing for you? So we've done four things. Grounding, turning inwards, mentally, emotionally, physically, right? We did settling breath, the longer exhale than inhale. We did resourcing, find a most comfortable physical sensation, and butterfly hug, right? So just to think to yourself, which one did you like best? Which one did you like best, and how do you know? What did it do for you? And just kind of reflect on that for yourself. What changes you noted? Just reflecting on for yourself. And you, again, might not have liked any of them. So some signs that your stress is coming down. One, you're moving from 
you're moving from a higher level of stress to a lower level, okay? But recognizing if you're moving from freeze, you don't just drop into your social nervous system, you have to pass through fight flight. So there can be a, that, that unnumbing where you actually go, you know what, I don't feel all that better. I actually feel more. And I've heard people say, it's like going from feeling dead to feeling alive. I feel more pain, but I'm alive. And that means you're moving towards settling. It's just, there's some ways to go. You may notice yawning. Yawning is a sign of nervous system downregulation. It's a social signal of safety. It has no bearing how tired you are. Over and over again, people think, I yawn because I'm tired. No, you feel tired because you're safe. Your body is allowing you to feel the tiredness. You've been pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing because for whatever reason it's not safe and suddenly you feel safe enough, you yawn and you're like, wow, I'm so tired and you connect the two. So I'm a big fan of uncovering our mouths when we yawn and changing that social norm. So I say it like all the time, <laughs> like I'm facilitating, I don't know, six times this week, six groups. I'm like, uncover, uncover, uncover. Um, when I yawn, and I look at you, that's literally from my body, which cannot lie, you can't really fake a yawn. It's saying to you, I'm safe, I feel safe here. Versus, what if I say, trust me, right? Like every abuser says, trust me, it means nothing. But when I yawn, that's saying, trust me from deep inside. So when you work with people, if they yawn, fantastic. Uncover your mouth, unless you've got food in there. Uncover your mouth. And we need more social signals of safety and okayness. It's, that's why it's contagious, right? It's safe, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. I do want to point out that you cannot be in your social nervous system and a defense response at the same time. So some people will say, I'm so social. If you're slightly worried, slightly anxious, slightly irritable, you are in fight flight. It may be low fight flight. It may be very adaptive to your circumstances, but it is not your social nervous system. So just know that, right? And if you're finding no space in your day, in the places you work, in the places you live that support the social nervous system, that's, you know, some cause for concern and what's being done about that. So if I can leave you with these guiding questions, these are from the Resilience Toolkit. These are your guiding questions. And so it's almost even if you never use those four practices again, you practice the toolkit when you ask yourself these questions. What is my state, my stress state, and how do I know? Again, that grows your self-awareness when you can answer the question, how do I know? Right? Saying I'm anxious does not have a lot of detail. How do you know? Get granular. Is my response adaptive in the moment? Is it adaptive in the moment? If it's serving you, there's nothing to do. Use that stress to keep yourself safe, to perform, to do what you need to do. But when that situation is over, that's when you're realizing, is this no longer adaptive? It's not, if your stress level is not adaptive to the situation, what practice can I use? And you have many, many practices available to you beyond these four. And the last question is, how do I know it worked? Because if it didn't work, next. I don't have a lot of time, most of us don't. I want really effective methods to drop my stress level so I can stay attuned and responsive to the environment that I'm in. I don't want to be wasting energy where I don't need to be wasting energy. There's enough places asking for my energy where it really is needed. I don't want to be blowing it where it isn't. And when you repeatedly, one of, two of the big determinants of resilience is self-awareness and the capacity for self-regulation. And this is that, right? And repeated practice helps you be responsive to the stressors that are actually showing up in your life. You're not stuck higher, right? If the situation is calling for this level of stress and you're always running this, that's a waste. What are you gonna do with that extra energy, okay? 
right? It creates allostatic load. It creates chronic health problems, chronic mental health, physical and mental health problems, right? And so can we build this level of resilience where we're actually tracking and responsive to our environment and not wasting that energy, right? So then we're able, something happens, we track with it, and then when the situation is better, we recover. We're able to bounce back, right? That's this level of resilience. And, but I wanna offer even like a, a bigger North Star, so to say. It's not just about bouncing back from adversity, right? But what happens when we're not wasting that extra bandwidth? We can use it to change the very systems of adversity that are pressing on us in the first place. So when I talked about self-care in the context of we can't fix systems problems with self-care, but systems problems won't fix themselves, it's on us to fix them, we need to have this level of resilience to be able to fix systems problems. And we like to call this alchemical resilience where you're able to transform those systems of resilience, right? Alchemy is making something greater from the original ingredients. Spinning gold from straw. I am at time, I imagine. Um, so thank you all so much. I hope this was useful and supportive and I'll be around for questions.